So, good afternoon. Thank you, Wolfram, especially for um, giving me the honor to give the keynote lecture and congratulations to a really great um, heart and stroke uh, symposium here. Um, so these are my conflicts of interest. Um, and I really would like to convince you uh, that the stroke heart syndrome is an important and relevant entity. Um, it is, however, unclear what should be the diagnostic standards and what are the therapeutic consequences. And um, I'm convinced that we will solve that during the next few years. Um, I would like to make a bit of an advertisement for that stroke heart syndrome. It's something that we described um, in this recent article also together with Wolfram. And during my talk, I will show data uh, mostly from our own group. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Jan Scheitz and also Christian Nolte, who just represented before, uh, who did most of the studies and contributed uh, to that work. Um, and we really believe that the stroke heart syndrome is, is nothing new. Um, however, it's, it's a continuum of a cardiac compli acute cardiac complications ranging from mild subclinical troponin elevation up to acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction. They comprise cardiac arrhythmias and even sudden cardiac death and also variable um, effects um, on ejection, fraction, and cardiomyopathy. It's been known for many years that uh, a lot of stroke patients suffer from cardiac complications, and th that is up to 10 to 20 percent. And I think um, it's not only a frequent complication acutely after stroke, but also in the subacute phase and in the chronic phase. Overall, cardiac death is ranked second um, after ischemic stroke, but after day 14, it's actually the most frequent cause of death in stroke patients. And, and that uh, temporal uh, risk profile is incompletely understood. What is happening acutely, what is happening subacutely, and what's happening uh, in, the, in the more chronic phase. I think the easiest way to pick up cardiac or a cardiomyocyte death after uh, brain ischemia is to measure troponin. Um, it's a very sensitive cardiobiomarker, and it is recommended in guidelines, such as in this guideline by the American Heart Association, Stroke Association. Um, it's uh, uh, <laughs> uh, class one evidence to measure troponin. What the guideline does not say is what to do if the troponin is elevated, and that's actually the, the big problem, other than not withholding thrombolysis, which is, I think, I agree upon. And, and that has been recently revised as an updated guideline, and it's, it's the same recommendation. Um, let me talk a little bit about troponin. I, I'm, I'm sure all cardiologists know everything about it, um, but there are a few misconceptions. One frequent misconception is troponin can be elevated by an ischemic stroke. That is true. Ischemic stroke patients do have troponin elevations. However, what is not true is that the troponin comes from the brain. Troponin is always released from cardiomyocytes, uh, and, and very specifically so. And of course, it does not always say that that patient has an acute coronary syndrome or an ischemic problem with the heart. It could be any type of cardiomyocyte death. It could be also renal impairment, and then the steady state of troponin excretion is, is changed. So the, the causes of troponin uh, elevation can be manifold. However, the source of troponin are always cardiomyocytes. And at the Charité, at our stroke unit, we performed two types of studies to understand the role of troponin in stroke. One was a retrospective study, where in about 1,000 stroke patients, we looked how often is troponin elevated, what's the range of troponin elevation, and what are the characteristics of stroke patients with troponin elevation. And then, in a minute, I will talk about a prospective study 
to look at outcome of stroke patients with troponin elevation. We use troponin T assays, uh, equally sensitive are troponin I assays, and then there are high sensitive cutoffs and regular cutoffs, and this you need to know a little bit to understand the different frequencies of troponin elevation in different studies. What we find is that there's a Gaussian distribution and few patients with very high troponin elevations. If we use the high sensitive troponin T assay, we find that 50%, more than 50% of all stroke patients have some sort of troponin elevation beyond the 99 percentile. That corresponds to 14 nanograms per liter. And about 13%, one in seven stroke patients, has the troponin elevation higher than the standard cutoff of 50 nanograms per liter. So it's a frequent finding with few patients with high troponin elevation. So what are the characteristics of stroke patients with troponin elevation? They are older, they have more severe strokes, and not surprisingly, they have more cardiovascular comorbidities. So age over 75, NIH on admission, higher increase, and then congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, all this contributes to a higher likelihood of troponin elevation. Also, we find stroke-specific factors such as insular cortex involvement, and I will come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> now we performed a second study, also by Jan Scheitz, that we looked prospectively what would be the outcome of stroke patients with troponin elevation. And again, that's a study we did, but there are other studies out that show similar findings. <clears throat> this is how the range of troponin elevation compares stroke in stroke patients to uh, an elderly general population or to a normal population, and we see the shift to the right in the, in the stroke patients. So what about outcome? And this now is a study, 1,016 prospective stroke patients at the Charité. In this cohort, 60% with some sort of troponin elevation and 13% with the higher cutoff. And what we find is when we look at tertiles, this is unfavorable outcome measured by the modified ranking scale that would be higher than two. And this is in hospital mortality, and you see those dependently that whatever the reason for troponin elevation, stroke patients with troponin elevation have poor outcome. And that is even more true for those patients that have dynamic changes in troponin. So some of these patients have a chronic elevation. They would have had troponin elevation before the stroke, and they do not show any dynamic in subsequent measurements. But a fraction of those patients, similar to an acute coronary syndrome, have a, a rise or fall pattern. And then you know it's a dynamic change. And if you compare those groups, dynamic change or stable, cha or, or stable elevation, you find that the outcome here measured survival or mortality during uh, in hospital stay, um, it's largely elevated. So these are the patients at high risk that need special attention. What is unclear from just looking at troponin level is what is the exact pathophysiology of a given patient, what is going on in the heart. And if you look at it in a simple dichotomous way, and we know that the real world is different from a simple scheme, but if you look at it in a simple scheme, the reason for troponin elevation could be acute ischemic myocardial injury, even a type 1 myocardial infarction, or it could be other causes, including stress-mediated neurocardiogenic uh, mechanisms of troponin elevation. So we performed a small prospective diagnostic study where we asked the question, how often in stroke patients with troponin elevation would we find a correlate of an acute coronary syndrome that is a culprit lesion in a coronary angiogram? And we compared that 
to the frequency of culprit lesions in patients coming to our emergency department with chest pain, like classic acute coronary syndrome patient population. And so that's the algorithm, acute stroke brain imaging. Um, we only included ischemic stroke with a, a level of high sensitive troponin above 50, and we excluded patients that had uh, renal impairment to exclude those that had other causes of, of uh, troponin elevation. And then we performed coronary angiograms and looked how often would stroke patients have any form of chronic coronary uh, heart disease, and how often would we find a culprit lesion. And these patients are um, matched to uh, chest pain uh, 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 um, uh, chest pain patients. And it's a small study, 29 ischemic stroke patients, 29 uh, chest uh, uh, pain patients, uh, similar age, similar sex, uh, similar elevations in troponin and also risk factors. And these are the findings. How often any form of coronary um, uh, heart disease, almost all um, chest pain patients had coronary heart disease, a bit more than 50% of the stroke patients. And how often did we find culprit lesions? And that's the finding. 25 of these stroke patients had a possible or definite culprit lesions. And most of these patients eventually had intervention, either acutely or if the bleeding risk was considered to be too high uh, in the subsequent days. So that is certainly different from a classic acute coronary syndrome patient population. So it's significantly lower. But my interpretation is it's far too high to be unrecognized. Right? So we would like to know which of the stroke patients with troponin elevation have an acute coronary syndrome and an acute culprit lesion and which don't. And at present, we do not have a predictor to identify those patients. And, and that is the reason we're just starting another prospective study um, which is uh, termed the PRAISE, sorry for that, so how do I go back, which is called the PRAISE study, Prediction of Acute Coronary Syndrome, and the aim is to develop a diagnostic algorithm to predict acute coronary syndrome in stroke patients with troponin elevation. Similar inclusion criteria than the previous trailer uh, study, the primary endpoint is an acute coronary syndrome with calprodesion and coronary angiogram, but this is then uh, decided by an independent endpoint committee, not knowing about the exact troponin level. Um, and that will include information on ECG, echocardiogram, angiogra uh, coronary angiography, and I hope that we can come up with a predictive score and diagnostic algorithm to identify those patients that need to go for intervention. Um, so. The uh, primary investigators uh, is uh, also Ulf Landmesser, the, the chief of cardiology here from the Charité, Campus Benjamin Franklin, he will speak tomorrow, and also Christian Nolte, which you just heard before, and it's a prospective multi-center study in Germany. So if one in four patients potentially have an acute coronary syndrome, what is with the other three in four patients? What's happening in those patients? They have some sort of non-ischemic myocardial injury either unspecific, they have sepsis or renal failure, or they have what we could call a neurogenic heart syndrome, stress-mediated troponin elevation. So how would that work? And, and that is well known from the literature from different clinical situations. Take somebody with a subarachnoid bleed, young patient, perfectly normal coronaries, extreme pain, changes on ECG and troponin elevation, what might happen is a sympathetic storm, release of catecholamine and other stress mediators, and then at the cardiomyocytes, cardiac receptor calcium channel, mediated calcium influx, ECG changes, wall motion changes, maybe resembling Takotsubo, and necrosis of cardiomyocytes that form contraction bands. And this is something that can also happen remotely, and for example, has been 
also identified as mechanism of acute cardiac death in, in, in voodoo ceremonies, for example. This is how these contraction band necrosis look like if you look at them at the electron microscopy. And these are these are contraction bands. This is actually a uh, sad monkey with a pheochromocytoma, so that's a different background. But also you would find that in, in musculature after such stress-mediated cardium myocyte death. So I'm showing another vignette that uh, Jan Scheitz um, collected, uh, a, a patient that he treated a few years ago at our school unit. It's a nice 82-year-old uh, lady that presented with a uh, stroke with sudden aphasia. Um, she had MRI, and actually had a pretty small stroke um, here in the insular cortex. At day two, she developed dyspnea and tachycardia, and we measured troponin, and it was largely elevated, and she was included in the Trillers trial, and underwent coronary angiography, and, and this was perfectly normal. So she belonged to the three or four patients that had normal uh, coronaries. And, and what we found is apical ballooning, so it was a full-blown phenotype of a type of myopathy. Actually, these typical cases are pretty rare. We find them sometimes. Uh, but, but probably there's a continuum of, of Takotsubo-like cardiomyopathies with troponin elevations that are quite frequent. Um, so what we then uh, ask is, um, with this finding in the insula, are there specific lesions in the brain that are more likely to produce troponin elevations than others. And there are other studies in the literature. And, and we did it with a voxel-based symptom lesion mapping. So we took out of our database from 1,000 patients with troponin measurement, we took 200 patients where we had MRI evidence of the lesion location. And the voxel-based lesion symptom mapping was a question for the troponinogenic lesions. So we included troponin as a continuous parameter. And then we correlated this with lesion location. And we looked for troponin elevation and stroke lesions. We would find no correlation at all. Then we then integrated troponin dynamic rise and fall pattern. Then we would find a specific lesion, and this is work by Thomas Krause, Jan Scheitz, Jan, uh, Christian Nolte, and others. And that troponinogenic lesion that popped up as a significant predictor of troponin elevation was the right dorsal anterior insular cortex. And if you increase the um, statistical power, you uh, come up with a pretty um, defined lesion here in the right dorsal insular cortex. So what does that part of the brain do? If you do stimulation studies and you stimulate left or right insula, what you find, for example, is an increase in sympathetic tone if you stimulate the right insula. You will find hypertension, tachycardia, and arrhythmia. And vice versa, an increase in parasympathetic activity when you stimulate the left insula. So the insular lobe, left and right, with some lateralization, is in the phrenology, is the brain a representation of the central control of the autonomic system. And that may explain part of that stroke heart syndrome that we see in these patients. And it's also predictive for death after stroke. Several studies have shown that. We've looked at this in our own database. It's not the trailers database, but it's an imaging database, and we found here. And it's, 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 it's very important that you correct for lesion size and severity because most strokes that comprise the insula are big MCA strokes, so that makes it a difficult uh, evaluation. But here, significant for the right insula, not significant for the left insula, but mostly due to power, we certainly find a difference for increased mortality in insular stroke. Insular stroke may also be predictive for new onset arrhythmias, in particular atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is not only a cause of a stroke, but also the consequence of a stroke. And out of our database, 
in the Trelas database, we looked at those patients that had, sorry for that, that had newly identified atrial fibrillations, about 10% in that cohort, and we looked for independent predictors for the appearance of new atrial fibrillation. And what popped up was a lesion in the insula and elevated troponin, and also the monitoring time, not surprisingly so. So insular cortex involvement, stroke in the central autonomic control may induce also atrial fibrillation. So what we think what's happening in the stroke heart syndrome on the pathophysiological level, on the cellular level, is that we find activation of stress systems, the sympathetic nervous system, the HPA axis, also other potentially inflammatory or prothrombotic mediators, and then we have effects on the cardiomyocytes and on the microvessels leading to electrical instability, hypercontraction, metabolic stress, endothelial dysfunction, and you have a, a wide range of clinical uh, sequelae. We can also look at this in animals, and that has the advantage that these animals do not have atherosclerosis. They do not have underlying vascular disease. Healthy young animals, and we can just study in silico or in vivo the pure neurogenic mechanisms. And in our hands, if we induce a mild stroke in the mouse, we also find troponin elevation. We also find um, uh, 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 other uh, uh, cardiac biomarkers to be elevated, and we find evidence of a diastolic dysfunction developing. These are milder strokes, and if we look in the uh, cardiomyocytes, we find necrosis and also apoptosis, but not infarcts. And just the last two years have seen uh, an, an increasing number of publications looking in experimental stroke models on the stroke heart syndrome. And I think the most important work comes from Christoph Kleinschmitz, uh, Würzburg, now Essen, who described stroke-induced chronic systolic dysfunction. So he did not look at the acute phase, but at the chronic phase. He was interested in uh, development of, uh, of um, uh, decreases in ejection fraction. And he found um, a decrease in ejection fraction uh, in animals following right MCAO, and that went along with an increased sympathetic drive, higher heart rate, and he could block that when he treated the animals with beta blockers. Whether that is a potential treatment in stroke patients, I'm not sure, but it's an interesting finding. And similar findings here from another group published in stroke from France. This is looking more acutely here on left ventricular fractional shortening. So they find um, ischemia reperfusion, also myocardial cardioprotective pathways and increases heart vulnerability, more so with left-sided stroke. And that is also a finding that Roland Feldkamp had in a mild and more severe stroke model that after left MCIO, he would see significant decreases in ejection fraction um, in more severe strokes. So I would like to conclude that we can describe a stroke heart syndrome in 10 to 20% of stroke patients. It has a wide range of subclinical troponin elevation up to acute coronary syndrome, left ventricular dysfunction, cardiac arrhythmia, that then is modified by modified by the comorbidity that the patient has, by stroke-specific determinants, insular or not. What is unclear is the short and long-term outcome of these changes. We need to follow these patients up in terms of development of arrhythmias, in terms of development of cardiomyopathies, uh, uh, systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure. So, Approximately 20% of ischemic stroke patients have evidence of the stroke heart syndrome. Troponin elevation is frequent, 50% with conventional, 50% with high sensitive assays associated with stroke severity, age, and cardiac comorbidities, but also insular lesion. In any case, it's a predictor for poor outcome. 
and the diagnostic and therapeutic consequences need to be determined. Thank you for your attention.